reoccurring themes in the Bible is that of suffering. Would you care to comment? Yes, if we r read through the scripture, we see suffering from the be beginning we turn from Genesis to the very last pages of the book of Revelation. But we are promised there'll be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more tears. All those things will pass away. But we're in the, the stage of life now, right where there is a lot of suffering. And we see that in the brokenness of humanity. And the challenge thing that we face is that if I go out and talk about the gospel of suffering, no one's going to come to church because it's not the sugar-coated gospel that sometimes we hear. Sometimes in the Christian community, you hear the wealth and health and wealth gospel, that um, when you follow Christ, you'll be healthy and wealthy. Well, Scripture doesn't say that. In fact, Scripture says exactly the opposite. Those who follow Christ in this world will suffer. And that's a prevailing theme right throughout the Scripture. And the big question that we have to ask is why? Why suffer? Why did God allow the Garden of Eden to have the devil in there right from the very beginning, that serpent, ready to trick the woman to play tricks on the man? Well, he did. And right from that very time, we've seen the condition of the human story. It's suffering, written in blood. Now, we have the story of Jesus coming into this world amidst Roman occupation. There's nowhere for him to give birth, so he doesn't have a lavish welcome. And we read in the prophets a prophecy about Jesus where he said he was a man acquainted with grief, familiar with suffering. And that begins to tell us something about the journey of Jesus Christ. So um, all of scripture, all of our destiny, all of our identity, all of our salvation hinges on Jesus. And to begin to understand suffering, we really need to look at Jesus Christ. How does this suffering affect us? The suffering affects us. There's two different kinds of levels of suffering. The suffering, when I do something stupid and I get a police fine because I was speeding. So I've suffered, I've got to pay my $400 and I deserved it. There's another level of suffering that affects the Christian is that you suffer for righteousness. You suffer for that which is right. Jesus said to his disciples, no one can be my disciple unless he deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me. Denying yourself is not, denying yourself is from those natural human tendencies for comfort and for self-preservation. To pick up your cross was to carry on your shoulder the implement by which you'd be crucified, killed. And to follow Jesus carrying that cross is to walk against the jeering crowd. You are walking a path that's difficult. Scripture says that, you know, the way to life is narrow. The gate to life is difficult and there's a few that find it. And that's really telling given the focus that's on Christ, the, the reality that Jesus came into this world, suffered and suffered not just for his own purpose, but he suffered for us. And that suffering for us is that as his disciples we are going to be affected by suffering. Jesus said, if they have persecuted me, they will persecute you also. He said, a servant's not greater than his master. In other words, whatever I've gone through, you can expect much the same because you're dealing with the same human nature. And if we look at history, out of all those disciples that were following Jesus, apart from John, all the others were martyred. They went to their graves and suffered horribly because they believe in Jesus. And the calling for us today is likewise, in our experience, we are promised not health and wealth, we are promised suffering to carry the burdens of others, to stand amidst for the right reasons. In other words, to suffer for righteousness. If I suffer for foolishness and my own foolishness, that's my big stu stupidity, but to suffer for righteousness, this is where character grows. And in the big heavenly equation, there's a beautiful scripture that refers to, to the suffering now compared to the glory later. Because Jesus entered now into glory, but he preceded that by suffering. And he is known as our high priest, our elder brother, the first fruit of many. Let me turn to that scripture. Romans 8 verse 17. And if children, children of God, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, 
provided we suffer with Him in order that we may be glorified with Him. There's another scripture in Hebrews that tells us that Jesus was made perfect or complete because of suffering. And He is the captain and pioneer of our salvation. And so our journey would never be complete. We would never manifest ourselves fully as the children of God if we lived a life without suffering. And the fact that Jesus was made complete through suffering means that in his role as high priest in heaven, he's able to empathize. When you suffer and you pray in Jesus' name, he knows what you're going through. It's not as if we've got a supreme, perfect God outside of creation. He entered creation and he shed his blood in the most gruesome of ways. And the legacy for us as his disciples, we may not have to shed our blood. His blood was shed once for all. But we pick up that cross every day when we stand for what's right. What about the suffering of Job? What can we learn from this? Uh, the, the story of Job in the Bible is one of the ancient, probably the most ancient text in the scripture. And it's very confronting because we see a man who's doing well and he finds himself having lost his seven sons and three daughters. He loses all his wealth. He finds himself at odds with his wife who she doesn't understand what she's, he's going through. And he finds himself as the weeks and months go by sitting on an ash heap covered in boils, very, very miserable. And it's quite a convoluted story of a man suffering in the presence of God, wondering why God allows a righteous man to suffer. And it's a classic story of a, a good man, a righteous man. Even though he doesn't understand everything, as he learns later on, he's suffering in what he doesn't know. And in that suffering, he finds God in the end, Sovereign, supreme, beautiful, glorious, beyond reproach. Because if you follow his dialogue, he asks God some pretty tough questions. In the beginning, he begins, God is given, God is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't know whether I'd be able to say that if I lost my seven, children, seven sons and three daughters, and my wife was against me, and I lost all my wealth, all my servants, all my camels, all my sheep, and from a wealthy, rich man who's prosperous in the country to become a beggar sitting on an ash heap suffering from boils. And the story seems to go over weeks and weeks and months. And we see a man suffering through extraordinary circumstances because he's the centre of a conversation between God and Satan. He didn't realise that. He doesn't know that. He's a pivot of all the universe watching him. And he's suffering because it's a bit of a bet. You think, well, this is a bit fair, unfair of God to bet against Satan, uh, uh, valuing a man's life and causing him enormous suffering. The bottom line is that in Job's journey, all that he'd lost was restored to him, but the greater part that was restored to him was a full, more comprehensive knowledge of God. If we don't go through experience of suffering, we would never really fully come to understand grace, mercy, compassion, healing, wholesomeness. Sometimes you look at creation and you see God made beautiful animals like lambs and butterflies, but he also made crocodiles and and um, mosquitoes. And God says, I'm sovereign, I've made them all. So we are born into an environment where we'll see a crocodile rip apart a baby deer. And we go, oh, how horrible, how wrong, how unjust that is. So we created an environment that we're going to experience tragedy, brokenness, what seems unjust. The reason it seems unjust is because there's a divine law to the human being that compels us to understand what's good and what's holy, what's unholy. Unfortunately, we live in a generation where those lines are blurred. And in the West, all we want to seek, seek about is our comfort. Superannuation, two sports cars, speedboat, spa, in property investment, all these sort of things. Um, and I suppose that's why the gospel is so difficult to penetrate, for example, affluent Western Europe and parts of throughout the English-speaking world because we are so prosperous. We don't have the baptisms that we have in the West that we do have, for example, in Africa and Asia, where on, on a single day you can have up to 50 people baptised, accepting Jesus Christ as Lord, because they live in a circumstance that is full of suffering. And the gospel message is, in Christ, one day you'll experience glory. No more tears, no more mourning, no more crying, no more suffering. And when you live in a broken, broken world, when anything that makes sense around you is painted by suffering, you look forward to an awesome promise and you're prepared to follow Jesus because you know what suffering is. And I think our lives in the West have been so prosperous 
that we don't have a need for God and we try to shield ourselves from any kind of suffering. So the story of Job is a man being reconciled to God through how? Through suffering. Extraordinary suffering. Um, But it's a powerful lesson for us and we see a man in pain and that makes us understand like you and I in our lives at times will be taken to the threshold of suffering, sitting by somebody's bed in an intensive care after they've had a severe traffic accident or some other circumstance, the loss of a loved one causing us to grief, to to have grief. We will go through suffering. Um, The bottom line is scripture encourages us to stand tall and bear it because glory awaits. In the context of suffering, how are we to deal with sin? One of the things that Jesus talks about is how suffering helps us get rid of sin. He said it's better to pluck your eye out than look at a woman deceitfully, so to speak. In other words, it's better to suffer in this life with your eye pulled out than looking on sin than it is to have your whole body destroyed by fire, hellfire because you've carried sin with you. So it's better to suffer in this life in order to deal with sin. And the idea of plucking your eye out so you're not going to look and sin is a metaphoric message. It's better to suffer and learn to trust God through circumstances than put our eyes on something evil. Scripture talks about the fleeting pleasures of sin. Now I can give you a long list of fleeting pleasures that will bring human satisfaction. But on the divine equation of eternity, these fleeting pleasures of sin lead to death. And unless we repent and come before Jesus, Lord God, and say, Father, forgive me in Jesus' name and take on a new life, then those sins will will be part of the equation that will be measured in our judgment. Sometimes suffering is described, especially in um, Job's story, as not the executioner's whip, but the doctor's scalpel. Part of the healing process through suffering is to get rid of sin. And I like the analogy between the executioner's whip that sometimes we feel that suffering is, as opposed to the doctor's scalpel. Yes, we'll feel pain, but the idea is for healing and wholesomeness on a spiritual level. If we as Christians have to go through all this suffering, what is the overall outcome? Why do we have to go through all of this? Oh, that's a really good question. That gets to the heart and core of what it is to be a Christian, what it is to be a follower of Christ. Uh, when Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me, um, and he said, no disciple is greater than his master. And there's, a, there's a, a part of us being perfected through suffering that would never, ever happen any other way. And we're going to share in Jesus' glory. And there's a powerful scripture that I read from um, Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. For it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. So it's easy to believe in Jesus. It's much harder to suffer for his sake. Jesus, we are his children, his disciple, our father's children, followers of Jesus, and that we walk his path. And his righteousness is made complete in us through suffering, where never again as children of God will we have people to, let's say, Beings turn against God. Satan the devil took a third of the angels with him as rebellion against God. There was war in heaven. We always think of heaven as being beautiful and peaceful and and, and, and paradise. There was a time when there was war in heaven. There was suffering in heaven. And Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Um, We have followed Jesus and we are made perfect and complete through suffering. It's the most un most difficult equation we can ever get our mind around. But once we come to understand it, we become at peace with it. God, I know you'll never leave me. I know you'll never forsake me. I know that one day I will share in glory. But you are allowing the righteousness of Christ to be formed in me. And a Christ without suffering is not Christ in me at all. It's an unusual equation. Christ came, he suffered, he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He suffered on our behalf and our suffering in the name of Christ, that's important to hold here, our suffering in the name of Christ allows Christ to be formed in us. So the Father sees in us images of Jesus Christ with the right to the tree of life, the right to live forever, for glory eternally. Suffering 
for us will not be an ongoing equation through all eternity. We are formed in the flesh, and in our lives we experience great joy, great successes, but also great disappointments and extraordinary suffering. And unless you experience suffering, you never develop empathy, kindness, caring to the great depth you would unless you've been through a terrible experience. I can speak of personal experiences that I've been through that have totally transformed me. Sitting in a nursing home with somebody dying, being in intensive care ward for three months for someone who attempted suicide. Circumstances that brought me to the brink of I don't know what to do, I don't know what my resources, God help me. But through that process, and now I look back on it, I am a different person as a result of it. I didn't wish to go through it. Job didn't wish to go through it. But I think we'll all look back on the suffering where Jesus is the pioneer of our salvation. And the bottom line reflects on we are being saved, we are being equipped, we are being built and grown up into the statue of Jesus. And because Jesus suffered, our journey is one of suffering, but the reward that's offered is extraordinary. And Paul says in Romans that all of creation yearns for the revealing of the sons of God. For several things, that Jesus, the pioneer of our salvation, will be glorified like him. Many sons, not just one son now, many sons. And the end of suffering is in sight. The brokenness of the human condition will have served its purpose. Job's suffering served its purpose. Jesus' suffering served its purpose. And our suffering likewise has served its purpose. Thank you very much. I hope that what we've spoken about today will encourage those who are going through suffering of their own.